Hi, and welcome to the NCL Answers webinar by Newcastle University. We're live online answering your questions today about what happens after the UCAS deadline. My name is Pev Soulsby, I'm a recent graduate of Newcastle University, and I'm joined today by a panel of Newcastle staff. I'll let them introduce themselves. We'll start on this end. Hi, my name's Tom. I'm a senior teaching associate in the School of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. I'm involved in the programmes in Civil Engineering and Geomatics. Thank you, Tom. Hi, I'm Jane and I work for the Accommodation Service and I'm involved with all of the allocations and everything thereafter with the accommodation. And I'm Sarah, I work in the undergraduate admissions team and I deal with uh, applications to a lot of the marine science degrees. Okay, so we'll make a start with the questions that we've had submitted through people using the hashtag NCL answers. Our first one is the question on everyone's lips. It's coming from Fitra asking, when will I get my offer? Sarah, would you take that one? I will, um, and that's a very good question. I can't give a definite answer. Um, it varies depending on quite a few factors. Um, one big factor is when you actually apply to the university and the type of course you've applied for, because different courses have different ways of considering applications. Um, there are various things to bear in mind. If you apply in December and January, that's our peak season for applications. So we get a lot of applications in those months, particularly the first two weeks in January. So it normally takes a little bit longer than usual to, to process applications that come in at that time. There are other factors that come into play as well. Um, you need to consider if perhaps the course you've applied for invites candidates to interview, because that will kind of prolong the process. Um, we may need to get in touch with you to check some information on your UCAS application just to make sure we have the right information about your qualifications, um, in which case we'd email you. Some schools may even hold certain applications until after the 15th of January deadline and make decisions then. So again, you're going to have to wait a few weeks for that. Generally, we would say that we try and get back to you as soon as we can and preferably within three to four weeks. But when we're really busy, kind of December, January time, it will take a little bit longer, I'm afraid. Um, we work to a general UCAS deadline of the end of March. So anyone who applies by the 15th of January should hear from us by the end of March. So if you applied a few weeks ago, you're still hanging on, waiting to hear, don't panic. It's probably just that we're working through a lot of applications and we will get back to you as soon as we can. We know it's important to you to hear something quickly, so we do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. And another question that has been asked by quite a few people online is, when can I apply for accommodation? So, Jane, this is your area. Yes, thanks. Um, we're looking to open the online application at the end of February, beginning of March time. We're hopeful with this. We've obviously got testing and things to do beforehand. But you will be informed, everybody who's coming to study here at Newcastle University will be informed when the online application opens by email. That's great, thank you Jane. And uh, we have a question here, and this is definitely one for Tom because it's somebody asking about civil engineering. Um, ben has been invited to the open day and informal interview for the civil engineering course, and he's asking what are some example questions that he could be asked? Okay, Ben, well, it, it, it's it's great. I'm delighted with, with being working in civil engineering that you've applied for our courses, but I'm going to try and answer the question uh, quite broadly so that um, whichever course you've applied for, um, if you're watching this, you, 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 you can hopefully get a feel for what happens in an interview. The, the first question that, that we use in, in the school I work in for, for interviews is, is, is really why you've applied for the subject area that you've applied for. Um, and really what we're trying to do there is give you a chance to, to really show us your passion, your interest um, for the subject area that you're going for. Um, after that, we might ask, what have you done to support that? So yeah, we can see which subjects you're studying, uh, we've got your personal statement, but, but what can you tell us that supports that passion, that interest that you're going for? Have you been on any visits? Have you seen something on holiday? Did you go to any talks at your local university? Um, really just any little thing can, can really show us that, that you've done something extra, gone that extra mile to, to support your ideas, your passion for your subject area. We then normally ask something to, to try and find out a bit more about you and, and what you like to do outside of your studies. Um, we, we don't want a, a lecture theatre full of people who are exactly the same. We want people with different ideas, different backgrounds, different experiences. 
And, and so we'd be keen to hear whether you're a musician, whether you're involved in performing arts, whether you're a sports person, um, how do you like to spend your time when you're not studying? So that's always an interesting uh, part of an interview too. Then after that, we, we, we hope that um, we'll be able to see that you know something about the course that you've applied for. So yes, in, in your instance, Ben, you've applied for civil engineering at Newcastle. What do you know about that course as opposed to the civil engineering degrees at other universities? What can you show us that tells us that you've really done your homework on, on, on who we are and what we do? And then the other thing that we look for is whether you've got any questions. And sometimes they can be very, very simple. Um, sometimes uh, they can be quite complicated. But that's your chance really to, to, to judge, um, make your judgment really on, on, on the place that you've applied to, the place that you're visiting. So to summarize really why you've applied for what you, you have, what you've done to support that, what else you're going to bring to the subject area, and then have you got any questions of your own? That, that's the way most of our interviews run. That's great, that's really good advice, Tom, thank you. Our next question has come in from Thomas and he's asking, when is the deadline for him to decide for his firm and insurance decisions? So Sarah, I'll pass that one to you. Thank you. Um, there are various deadlines and they vary depending on the date that you get all the decisions back from the universities you've applied to. So. If you've submitted an application in November, say, and you've heard back from all your universities by the end of March, then you will need to make your choices by the 6th of May. Um, there are other dates after that. Um, I think there's a couple in June and there's one kind of mid-July. Um, but the main date that probably applies to most of you watching will be that 6th of May. The best thing to do, I would recommend, is to log into track and check there. It'll tell you if you've seen the, the results of all your applications and you can see whether you've been made an offer and you've heard back from all five universities, UCAS will tell you the date that you need to make those choices by. Great, thank you Sarah. And um, another question in from Harry who's asking when he will hear back about his accommodation application. Jane, if you could give some information there please. Certainly, uh, it's a good question Harry. Um, in regards to your accommodation application this is all done online so when you finish the process and you've chosen where you want to um, where you prefer to live you want to finish that application it does send you it tells you at the end that you've come to the completion of it and it will you'll also receive that confirmation email however I could also read into this question it that you might be asking is when you'll actually be made an offer of accommodation. Um, we do start to make offers of accommodation from May onwards, but you need to have an unconditional offer from the university that you have firmly accepted. So we don't release all of the stock because this would be unfair on students waiting for their results from their, from their A level or Scottish higher results, etc. So the way that you get your offer is through an email and it's as hopeful from the A-level weekends is that you get it within seven days of um, your results. That's why we stress to everybody that you use an email that you still have access to. You may have put your school email and you might lose the use of this email once you've left the school. Thank you. Great, thanks. So if you've just joined us, this is the NCL Answers webinar hosted by Newcastle University. We're answering your questions about what happens after the UCAS deadline day. And we've had questions submitted by people using the hashtag NCL Answers, like this next one from Sammy, who asks, do you still look at applications if the predicted grades have been boosted up since you received the application? Sarah, do you have any answer to this? I do, yes. Um, we don't get automatically notified um, by a change to predicted grades. So if you send us an application and then a few weeks later there's a change to those predictions, um, the best thing to do is get in touch with us. We'll need some information from your school, so your teacher will need to confirm the predicted grades. And we can add that to your application if we're still considering it. If we've already made a decision and you've been unsuccessful and you think that might be a factor, you can still get back in touch with us. Again, we'll need confirmation of the change to your predicted grades. And you can ask us um, to perhaps take another look at your application. It may not be possible in all cases, and it isn't possible if you've already made your choices and decided to go 
somewhere else, perhaps make a firm and insurance choice with other universities. But if you haven't done that, we may be able to return your application to the admissions tutor and they may reconsider based on the new information that you've provided. Great, thank you, Sarah. A question in from Patricia asking, when should I apply for my student loan? Now, Student Finance England haven't opened applications yet, but they will soon. So you can definitely start preparing now to make your application because you will need to provide some paperwork. So I would recommend getting your details together. You'll need to give them your passport details if you have a current valid UK passport. If you don't, you will need to submit a birth certificate or adoption certificate. They also need to know your national insurance number, your bank account details, and uh, information on which course you'll be attending. Now, you can apply for student finance before you have a firm offer or made your firm choice. Uh, what you can do is put in the most likely course you'll be attending and update it once your offer has been finalised. So I hope that helps, Patricia, but there will be more information on gov.uk. I think we'll be having a Hopefully the web address will be popping up on screen for you there as well. Do check because it does depend on where you live as well. So our next question is coming from Abdullah, which is, will there be accommodation available for students transferring to the second year of a course? Jane, would you answer that? Yes, Abdullah. It depends on how you are in, put into the system and with your year of entry. Um, this gets a little bit complicated, but what I'm saying is if it's we're not able to offer you university accommodation such as our halls though we will try to do this because we do appreciate that you're coming to Newcastle and uh, though it will be your second year of study it's your first time at Newcastle University however if we haven't got the availability as but we are always hopeful to be able to accommodate you we also have a team that uh, manages accommodation within the private sector. It's still very close to university and there's the type where it may be in um, flats or shared houses, but they also do have student halls of residence. Uh, currently, there are two student halls of residence that are very close to the university. So one way or the other, we would accommodate you. Great, thank you, Jane. Our next question in from Daniel who asks, I'm going to a post open date in Newcastle because I couldn't attend one of the scheduled ones. What will it consist of? Tom, would you take that one? Yeah, certainly. Um, we run quite a lot of uh, visits for people who haven't been able to make a scheduled open date, um, and uh, we're quite happy to do those. And, and so uh, what, will, what will happen is, is very similar to a scheduled day. It'll just happen on a sort of one-to-one -one or, or a much smaller group basis. Um, so normally there'll be a tour of the facilities that, that you might be using. Um, so maybe the laboratories, the computer cluster, um, the opportunity to have a look around the campus as well. Uh, so, so just to get your bearings really, find where your building would be, where the library is, where the halls of residence are. Um, you should be able to get a chance to have a chat with um, maybe some, some current students um, and, and a member of staff as well. Um, and I think one of the, the key things to say about, about visiting is remember it's, it, it's as much your day as the university's. So it, it make sure you get the questions that you have and the things that you want to find out on that day. Make sure you, you, you cover those during the course of the day. Um, so even though it's an unscheduled open day, I'm sure whoever you're seeing will be very happy to, to help you and to adjust their program to, to, to find any of the information that you want. But I think the key point about, about post-application visits is remember they're your day and, and really find out what it is that you want to know. That's great. Thank you, Tom. Our next question is from Yuri, who has asked, is there still a chance of getting onto our course if we fail short by a grade or two? Sarah, would you answer that? Well, um, I'm assuming that we're talking here about once you've got your A-level results in the summer. Um, normally what would happen is if you don't meet the exact conditions of your offer and you've made us either your firm and insurance choice, your application would be referred back to the admissions tutor um, and they would take a chance to look at it again as they would with everyone else who's failed to meet the exact grades that we asked them for. And normally by that point, we know how many spaces have been filled by candidates who've met all the conditions, and then we know how many we have left to fill on that particular course. So the admissions tutor will look through all those who've just missed out and see which candidates he think have the, the most potential of achieving well on the three course. Um, there's no guarantee, obviously, but if you've got good grades, um, there's nothing to worry about 
straight away, we try and make a decision as soon as we can. So we recommend that you check track on results day, um, see if there's any decision there, and if not, get in touch with us directly. That's great, thank you, Sarah. Now our next question is another accommodation question from Eliza, who asks, is the 500 pound accommodation application fee for postgrads only? Yes, absolutely, Eliza. It's the postgrad, just for the postgraduate students, um, there's no upfront payments required from the undergraduates who come to study with us. That's great. Nice, simple answer to that one. Thanks, yeah, Jim. <laughs> so um, our next question is, is it compulsory to attend a post-application open day? Tom, I wonder if you take that one. Yeah, it, it, it depends which subject area you're looking at, Joe. For some subject areas, yes, they're going to require you to attend an interview. They're going to require you to undertake some form of assessment um, to, to, uh, to complete the process of making an application. For some other subject areas, no, it's not going to be compulsory. Um, and, and even, I mean, in my school, for example, we, we do invite all of our applicants to come to a day, but, but it, it's not absolutely essential that you come if there's some reason that you can't make it. What I would say is wherever you're applying to, whichever school, whichever subject area, ask them whether it's compulsory or not. And if, and if you're struggling to get there, whether it's for time, um, ask whether there's some other dates when you'd be able to visit. Um, if it's uh, too expensive, um, outline that. And, and, and some places might be able to offer some travel expenses. And some places might be able to set up a, a phone interview um, or even a, a Skype interview for you as well. So unfortunately, it's a, it's a really good question, but there's not a quick answer. Um, sometimes it is compulsory. But for most subjects, it's not compulsory, but it is a useful part. But there can be quite a lot of flexibility around that um, and, and trying to help you to, to find out the information you want and also to help us get the information we want from you during your application. So I'm sorry if that's a bit vague, but I hope it helps. <laughs> Great, thank you. Our next question is from Rais, who has said, I, I've already had my offer and I put Newcastle as my insurance, but I think I've made a mistake. Can I swap you to my firm? Sarah, what would you advise in this situation? I would say, first of all, don't panic. Um, it will be fine. Generally, um, there is usually a way of changing your choices if you think you've made the wrong decision. So initially, if you've only recently decided on your firm and insurance choice, um, you would normally do this through track, and you have seven calendar days to change your mind. So if you've made us your insurance within the last week, all you need to do is log back into track, change those choices to the ones you prefer. Once we've, out, we've reached that seven days, it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's still manageable. Um, what you need to do in that case is, first of all, contact UCAS. So preferably give them a call, explain the situation, and tell them that you'd like to change your choices around. Uh, you then need to contact the universities involved. So you'd have to get in touch with us as your insurance and whoever you've made your firm choice and ask both of those universities if they'd be agreeable to the change. It's usually not a problem. Um, we usually have to say yes, and then we then need to contact UCAS in turn to confirm that we're okay with that change as well. So once everybody's been in touch with UCAS, that's when they'll update your record. Um, there's no immediate rush to do that. You have until, I think the last time you can change your choices is somewhere in July. There's a definite date and it changes each year, but um, you've got quite a few months. So if you decide in a few weeks time that you've made the wrong choice, there's a way around it. Great, thank you. Hopefully that put your mind at rest answering your question there, Ray. So our next one is from Daniel, who's asking about the differences between the main accommodation sites at the uni. He'd like to know the main differences according to facilities, which ones are more friendly, which ones have more of a community feel or are famous for their good parties? So Jane, what would you say to that? That's an excellent question, Daniel. Um, um, the main differences between the accommodation, we've got several different types. Um, I'll just start with the simple answers of we have accommodation which is on campus and accommodation which is off campus. When we're saying on campus, this is accommodation that is close to either directly on campus or close to the university within walking distance. Accommodation that's considered off campus is either on a bus or a metro link. Um, these are smaller sites, so in the main can be quite considered a quieter site, 
but then it all just depends on the students that go there and um, and how they they interact with one another and the student representatives for halls for all of the things that they can bring into place within those particular sites. When you say which is the friendly accommodation, I'll just say um, Newcastle in general is a very friendly place, so each and every one of them. Um, you're all coming you know, to study at Newcastle, doing all different subjects and from all different areas. And I, I think that initially it's, it's a, a very welcoming place when you're talking about communities, there's, we, co we consider the different accommodation types to have like smaller or larger communities, for example. Uh, our smaller sites, such as, as I've mentioned, the off-campus, we have a Windsor Terrace, which is directly on campus. Um, because of the bed spaces, that's what you need to look at when you're looking online. It'll give you an indication of how many bed spaces each and every one of our accommodation sites have. For example, one of the largest sites is Castle Leasers, which is very, very popular. So I think that you can also, when you're talking about um, parties, um, it's there's several of the sites that are considered to, to have a, a very much of a, a lively, shall we say, sociable feel to them. And that would, in the main, be with the larger sites, for example, the Castle Leasers I've mentioned and um, Richardson Road that we do currently have for accommodation. Great, thank you, Jane. Okay. Uh, questions come in from Hannah, who's asking, what is the dress code for interviews? Tom, if you take that one, please. Uh, no problem. Um, the, the, there's no real formal dress code, Hannah. Um, you, you, you need to find a balance between being uh, somewhat smart, but, but you don't need to go over the top. You don't need to turn up with a, with a full suit on. Um, but equally, jeans and a t-shirt maybe not quite the impression that you, that you want to be giving. So we appreciate that quite often people have to travel quite a long way, so you, so you want to make sure that you're comfortable. Um, so something like um, a small pair of trousers and a shirt, uh, something um, along those lines is, is, is fine. Um, but it, be, be comfortable. You know, if, if you think you're too smart, then the chances are you probably are. If you think you're a bit too relaxed, the chances are you probably are. So go somewhere in the middle. Um, I think if it was a if it was a formal party invitation, it would say uh, smart casual would would be the answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't, don't you don't need to pull the suit out, but maybe leave the jeans and t-shirts at home. That's great, thank you. Uh, we've had a question through from Sochima asking: Is it possible for first year students to get off campus accommodation? Jane, what would you say to that? Um, yes, definitely. I'm, I'm not sure if you're meaning our off-campus, such as the sites that I've mentioned previously. We currently have three that we consider off-campus because of the travelling. Um, these are Henderson Hall, St Mary's and Bowsden Court. Or if you actually mean accommodation that isn't through the university. And each and every student is welcome to do that, but we always encourage in particular first year students to come directly through ourselves because then you'll be accommodated with students from Newcastle University that have all that are all in the same position that are just starting the university and you can take your journey together. That's great. Thank you, Jane. Um, we've had a question through from Jane saying, I applied in November, how come I haven't heard back yet? Sarah, this sort of ties into what you've been saying before. It does, yeah, thanks. Um, I don't think there's anything to worry about. It's probably just down to the fact we've had a lot of applications in um, over the Christmas period and beginning of January. Um, it could depend on the type of course you've applied for as well. I would suggest that you make sure you check your emails just in case we've been trying to get in touch with you. We might have asked you for more information or you might have been invited to a, a, an open day or something like that. Also check your spam and junk mail folders because we know that they do sometimes disappear, never to be seen again. Um, so just make sure we haven't been trying to get in touch with you. Um, there may be other reasons for, for us not um, making a decision. It could be that the application that you've made is going to be held until after the 15th of January, and then the admission tutor will consider all of those for a particular course together. But again, if that's the case, we would have contacted you to let you know so that you weren't too worried about the wait. If you haven't heard anything from us and you're still concerned, 
um, I would recommend you get in touch. We have a, an online inquiries form on the website. You can give us your details and we'd be happy to look into the status of your application for you. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. And another accommodation question is how fast do accommodation places fill up? It depends on the sites. There's popular, the, the, as with everything, there's more popular accommodation sites than others. Currently, the trend for students is they're wanting um, places that are new that have ensuite accommodation, for example, Park Terrace. So it's, but the way the within the allocations, it's not on a first come first serve basis. It's um, the you get um, not to not to go into depth, but um, as I say, we do start to come uh, start to make the offers from May, but we also hold fifty percent of each and every one of our stocks. Um, and accommodations aside for the students coming through the A-level results. But um, when you're making your application for accommodation, please consider the amount of bed spaces that each accommodation site has. For example, if your heart is set on an ensuite at Windsor Terrace, there's 48 rooms and you have to divide this by two for male and female. So. The popular sites are the new ensuite accommodations currently. Great, thank you, Jane. And we've got time for just a few more questions today on our NCL Answers webinar. So uh, this one's coming from Adil saying, what happens if I don't get an offer? Um, I wonder if, Sarah, you could answer that. any advice for that? Yeah, I could um, start off. Uh, generally, um, if you haven't been made an offer um, from any of your five choices, it kind of leaves you the option to either make a sixth choice to extra if there's an area that you, you think you'd like to try that you haven't already applied for or the other option is to wait until clearing um, and see what happens then. If you're still waiting for your A-level results you'll obviously have to wait until you get those before you can then approach other universities to find out if there'd be a space for you there. Um, I don't know if Tom has anything to add to that. Yeah I think that the, the, the thing I'd say is that if if once you get your, your results, you, you think actually you, you've got results that would have been attractive to, to somewhere that you wanted to go to, do get in touch with, with the admissions tutor or the, the admissions team at Newcastle and ask whether there are any spaces. Uh, each year um, I've been aware of us uh, having people who have applied to us to whom we haven't made an offer who have then got in touch and said, well actually I've got these grades, um, is there a chance now? And we've sometimes we may not say, yeah, actually, yeah. Given given what you've you've now uh, achieved, yes, we, we can give you a place. Not all the time. Sometimes um, we might have, might have filled all the places already. So yeah, your options are are, are um, still open if if you don't get any offers. But once you've got your results, get in touch with people and find out if there's still something they can do for you. Great, thank you. Um, another question through from James saying, will I have to have an interview before I get my offer? Sarah, would you have some advice for James? Sarah? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Not all of our courses will expect you to come for an interview. Um, there are some subject areas that do require this. Um, subjects like medicine, dentistry, um, business accounting and finance, fine art and music. They would insist that you come for an interview as part of the offer process. Um, but they would contact you, they would email you, give you some options for interview dates um, and let you know what's involved. Other subject areas, I think as Tom was mentioning earlier, um, they might invite you to a, a post-application open day and that might involve an informal chat with admissions tutors or you know, alongside the tour around the building and the facilities and finding out a bit more about the subject. But some schools would prefer that you visited us first and then they will make a final decision on your application after that. Um, it's not essential um, that you have an interview in, that, in those situations um, and the schools in question would probably let you know more information about that when they emailed you to invite you to the open day. Um, so it, it, it's nothing to worry about, it's, it's all normal part of the course um, and the majority of our courses would make a decision on the application that you send us just on the information you've given to UCAS. That's great, thank you, Sarah. And uh, time for just one more question. So this is coming from Zoe, who says, I have a food allergy, I can't use some of the kitchen facilities. Would I be able to have something like a toaster in my room? Jane, would you be able to answer that? Yes, certainly. Um, normally, Zoe, we prefer you not to. This isn't because 
the, the main reason is due to health and safety and fire regulations. However, if um, you've when when st students have got um, health needs that impact on their accommodation, we require and um, we ask for you to to give us um, supporting evidence. And if this is supported that you do require such a thing as a toaster within your room, then we would allow this, but it would have to go through the site to be pap tested, just so it's all safe and usable once it's there. That's great. Thank you, Jane. And well, that's all we've got time for. That is the end of our live web chat session. So thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you found it useful and hopefully we'll be seeing you at Newcastle Uni come September. If you do have any more questions, you can visit our website, uh, visit ncl.ac.uk forward slash on course to NCL.